All right, what is good, everyone? So last week I was in New York City doing some of my work with SMB Capital, and probably the biggest topic that came up during my time there was dissecting that MULN or MOLN. I had tweeted it as being one of the easiest layups of the month so far, and I would say as far as um, ability to proactively spot the setup and see the setup, I think it might have been just one of the easier trades of the whole year, not that it was so crazy, crazy crushable, um, but I also don't think it was coincidental that um, Lucas was on top of this one, Raf was on top of this one, the SMB guys were on top of it, Nate was on top of it, Sam was on top of it. A lot of guys were in this setup for a reason, and so I wanted to do a deep dive dissecting why that is, as well as the different opportunities. Because what's so interesting and the beauty of what makes a market is Lucas only viewed this trade as a short. Um, I, on the other side, kind of viewed the best opportunity in it as being a long, um, and there were guys in SMB that played it both long and short. So we're going to dissect it. Um, a buddy of mine, Jacques, uh, called me up because he he also thought it was like a long, and and he's still kind of gaining his chops. And and like once I talked it through with him, that's when I realized like okay, like this is probably a good subject. A lot of people on Twitter agreed. So we're really going to dive in into my thought process and kind of how we look at these things at at SMB and elsewhere. For those of you following around at home, I figured out how to do some picture-in-picture -picture recording with OBS. I got the new Shure mic thanks to uh, Sound Recorder 100 who helped me step up my audio engineering game. So watch out, everybody. We're going to start off with the long-term picture for MULN. And so it's so important for people to recognize that, at least for me, I never look at any trade in a vacuum. I am always looking at it long term, I'm always looking at it um, on a three month chart, and I'm always looking at it intraday. The intraday chart is of course the most important um, because I am at the end of the day an intraday trader. Um, so the intraday chart is probably, I would guess, depending on, on the trade, maybe close to 70% of the decision power. Maybe the uh, three month chart is, is 25%, then maybe like a, that last 5% for the big picture. Uh, multi-year. So what I have up is MULN. This is a uh, three-year weekly chart, I believe. And what you'll see is um, at, at current share prices between splits and whatever else, this stock used to be much, much higher. We are talking 300 bucks, 350 bucks, $400. And so when I framed this trade for SMB, um, it, I think it's important to start here. Um, because even if I go to a yearly chart, which I'll hop to now, even if we're talking prices of 30 bucks, 25 bucks, $20, this stock was starting this move at around 12 cents. <laughs> so let's think about that, right? If you're, if you're holding the stock from 300 bucks, you are 99.9% .9 out of the money. If you are holding this stock from 30 bucks, you are 99% out of the money. Even if you're holding this stock from $10, right, which has been the last couple um, months, you are still, um, or not, sorry, that was uh, like a year ago in a couple months, but for many, many months, you're still 99% out of the money. So the only people that even see daylight are the very, very recent holders, right? And now think about this. If you're in this stock from 20 bucks or something, let alone 50 or 100, let's say the stock goes from 12 cents to 25 cents. Guess what? You're still down 99%. Even if this stock goes to a dollar or $2 or whatever, so many of those old school holders, whatever percent are left, are just infinitely out of the money and are in no way are they gonna sell this. And the reason why I'm walking through this logic is because I think it's so important to think about the psychology of the average holder in these stocks. So unless unless you bought very recently within the last month or two, you are ridiculously out of the money. And so now let me, let me zoom in a little bit. And now we're talking about a two month chart. And when when this stuff is going on, it's so important because even a month or two ago, we were at a buck forty, a buck or something, right? So when this stock is coming from twelve cents, there is a lot of wood to chop to gain any ground whatsoever. And 
now as people ride this essentially to bankruptcy, you have a high short interest and everything else. Um, the stock is essentially pricing in bankruptcy and I'm sure the people that are still holding short, it's effectively one of those things where it's like, okay, I don't even wanna pay the commissions to cover this, I'm just gonna take this to zero. Except something happens, right? On July 5th, the big thing that happens is they issue a PR that now essentially between their, their, their management is now going after all of the quote unquote naked short selling. Um, immediately, I think if you've been trading the last couple of years, that should ring a bell. So, so much of trading is about pattern recognition. And if you've done your homework and you've been Evernoting and you've been saving your charts and building these databases, all of a sudden an, an emergency bell should be ringing and the ticker that should be coming to your mind is GNS, Golf Nancy Sierra. If you guys recall back in uh, January of this year, they started going off after the naked short sellers and this stock went from 50 cents to five bucks, seven bucks, a massive, massive move, right? So that kicked off this whole flurry of other companies doing press releases like that. The low float game all of a sudden was back in action. So that's very important to keep in mind, right? Because this stock is probably the name that came to any pro trader's mind that's done the work. And immediately you need to think like, oh, wow, there is some major asymmetry to getting long that stock early because what did happen is so much momentum and so much... Um, so many people just piled on this long, noting that asymmetry. And so we are in a market that has been really rallying over the last um, couple of weeks and everything. We're starting to get a little bit um, above bubbly again. A lot of speculative stocks are really ripping, right? We have AI and Carvana exploding as I um, as I discuss this. So there is a little bit of a speculative fervor, right? And so this, this press re release in MULN comes out and any trader worth their salt is going to think, oh man, like this reminds me of GNS. And so here's the first question is if you see that headline, what is the risk of getting long there, right? The risk of getting long there is so small. Worst case, it just doesn't move, right? Um, it's so asymmetric. If you ask yourself, what if this does a GNS and really starts to squeeze, um, what if shorts start to cover this because they're scared too? What if this really catches momentum? The potential risk reward on this is so many multiples of the risk. You could see this going up 10 cents. You could see it going up 20 cents. It's not preposterous to think that this could go to 50 or 60 cents, right? GNS did. It's not out of the realm of possibility. <clears throat> I'm not saying it's greater than 50% or anything, but I do think the odds that this at least goes 10 cents is pretty darn high. Like, just based on experience, right, we'll never know what the true probabilities are, but I would put the odds of this going 10 cents maybe above 50%. And I would say the risk if this doesn't move is maybe you just lose commissions. Maybe I lose a penny or two. So if you plug that into the expected value formula, what you find out is that ends up being extremely asymmetric. And I don't necessarily even need to be the first buyer of this, right? Because if I go to... Um, you know, let's pull up kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe like the 10 day chart of this going, um, oops, I'm kind of botching this here. Eh, we'll just do it the old fashioned way. If I go up to this five day chart and go back to this, what we see is this headline comes out and volume is coming in the whole day. And so maybe you're not even the first buyer, but even if you're buying any of these breaks to highs, say at 12 cents, even say around 13 cents, once you already have some level of confirmation, the same argument is still there, right? Um, it's just so, so asymmetric. So maybe you just say, I'm gonna risk it to 10 cents and just give it that penny or two. Um, if you have the imagination and if you have the pattern recognition, this is just an asymmetric bet, no matter how you compute the math. Like I would, I would be real interested in any assumptions any reasonable assumptions people can come up with where that's not just super asymmetric. Um, and so I would say the first play essentially is buying that, that press release um, and having the vision to get long early on that headline. Maybe you buy some of these break to highs or, or add to that position there. And so we end up making a nice move to 19 cents. We have a light little pullback, but then we kind of hold this range into the close. And now here's what's really, really interesting about this close. 
This close represents what I would call another setup and what I would call um, and define as an overnight setup. So a lot of traders out there, when something closes very, very strong, when something does abnormal volume, they might consider, will this catch overnight momentum? And especially given how beaten down this stock is, again, who is incentivized to sell at 16 or 17 cents? Let's say you're short, you're paying borrow. This has got a kind of news catalyst, whether you call it BS or not, you're paying borrow, you're facing massive asymmetric skew. The most you will ever make on this stock if it goes bankrupt is still just 16 cents. You're gonna feel really silly if this ends up going to 60 or 80. So all the shorts are feeling really scared. All the longs are risking nearly nothing, even if it were to go bankrupt overnight, you know, this stuff, this thing will still trade OTC for something. So even the worst case is nothing. And now there's one other really key variable, and that is the volume. So if I zoom out to a one-year chart now, <clears throat> what we see is that that day we had done pretty much the most volume ever. Yes, I understand that this thing is, is way lower in price, um, not necessarily in dollar value, but simply in shares. So what happens there is what I like to call a lot of share turnover. And what that means is the average price of the average holder is changing a lot. So if we think about this chart, when we do that kind of volume, especially when stocks, especially in the low float space, are turning over multiples of their float, the average holder that is going to sell or is going to transact is turning over to a new shareholder base. And so what happens is the average price of the holder in this stock becomes way, way, way lower. When you do that much volume, most people are now with an average price in the low teens or something, and they're in the driver's seat. They know they're not risking that much at this point. Okay, so let's let's dive back into this now. So we've got massive average daily volume. So if I'm not in this stock, that's got my attention. And now the other thing that I would argue is this stock is up close to 70% on the day. <clears throat> Not only 70% on the day, but doing probably the most volume in the market. Like I think it did 1.4 billion shares. The other big thing is versus ADV, it's doing massive volume. So there are a lot of traders out there, swing traders, intraday traders, all sorts of different traders that have volume and price move filters out there, different scanners to spot interesting setups. And so even if you weren't watching this during the day, what happens is all the people after hours or overnight, this starts popping up on your, on your little scanners. Oh wow, what, what happened that this stock was up 70%? What happened that this did the most volume in the whole market? So that starts to get a lot of other attention and interest. And again, because of the asymmetry to the upside, um, a lot of people might join this momentum using GNS as that um, analog. And so sure enough, we kind of trade around, but now we're gonna jump to the next morning. We kind of get a little pop off the open, very, or sorry, not the open, but very the opening of pre-market trade very, very early. That's kind of common. Um, a lot of people might scalp into that. Um, the other thing th that happens now is at least for me, like if I'm in this stock at 17 cents, this stock a couple of weeks ago was at a dollar, a buck 50. Like me selling at 22 cents and paying commissions, that does not interest me. Like I am not necessarily in this thing to make five cents. I mean, it's like, I'll take it. But again, it, just, just between commissions and fees and stuff and, and how beaten down the stock is with this news catalyst, I want to have a little bit of imagination. Um, I want to see this, I don't know. 25 cents, 30 cents, 35, 40 cents. And ideally even hold some for the 50 cents to a dollar move if it's gonna happen. So I didn't have too much interest in selling in the low 20s. Um, now another thing that's interesting happens at 8 a.m. At 8 a.m., uh, they come out with another press release that they're authorizing a share buyback. Now that's super, super interesting because guess what? A share buyback takes cash. If this company is so bankrupt, why do they have the cash to buy back a huge percentage of their float? And so the second they announce that number and that press release, I'm immediately trying to figure out how meaningful is that amount. Um, that amount versus the overall float, um, which can be kind of tricky to track on these, but between Bloomberg, uh, like Dilution Tracker, like you, regardless of what numbers you were looking at, it was very clear that that is a meaningful number of the overall float. 
So now what's so interesting is you have people that are way out of the money, 99% plus out of the money, even if this goes to a buck. Then you have a bunch of holders that are brand new in the money and in the driver's seat. But guess what? If you're like me, you don't want to sell at 22 cents. You want to see this thing kind of make a move. Um, and you have a little vision, right? And so now all of a sudden what happens is another chunk of the float might be locked up if this company starts buying back shares. So this is kind of creating another piece of the puzzle. It's an, it's another positive news catalyst and it's creating this kind of narrative for, oh man, what if th this thing does squeeze? So especially when this volume starts to come in around 815, like I don't wanna be fighting that. If anything, I wanna be long and adding. And what happens is we kind of create like another resistance here at 30 cents. So 30 cents is kind of the realm of where I'd first want to maybe consider selling. Um, as we approach 30 cents, there's also now where you can start to make a kind of interesting um, possible short argument, right? I don't see any logical argument for why you would short the prior day with that news at 13 cents or 16 cents or why you would short that at the closing print. As we approach 30 cents, I think the strongest bear narrative that you can come up with is, hey, guess what? This thing's kind of, you know, now doubled off the lows. Um, a share repurchase doesn't mean they'll do it. The reality is this company is laden with huge amounts of debt and uh, this company just needs sales and it's not happening, right? Um, so you can start to argue now that at 30 cents, there's some meat on the bone for the short. Me personally, I'm still long biased. I want to see if this thing can drive. Um, plus the volume, even pre-market, is on track to be super amazing. So I kind of want to have a little imagination. We do a dip off the open. We managed to then take out that 30 cent pre-market resistance. And so once we break that, I want to have a little imagination that this can kind of make a really strong drive. Um, and ideally I wanna see it just stair step. It makes a leg, consolidates at highs, makes a leg, consolidates at highs. If we keep on stair stepping, I am going to hold this thing as long as I, as long as I can. Um, I don't want to get in the way of this volume. And so what ends up happening is that we, we make a drive, but we fail. Um, let me see if I can get a two minute, just cause that's what I normally do. My preferred time frame of choice. Okay. The old two minute. Oh, I got to zoom back a little bit. Oh no. Sorry, guys. Okay, there we go. First timer over here. First timer over here. Okay. So here we go with what I really want. A little bit zoomed in more of this intraday. And so what we can see is we make our drive above 30 cents. The volume is fantastic, but we can't really hold it. We fall and fail and we get back below. So that's not really what I want to see. Now I would say that we've tried to go and failed, that kind of changes the probability spectrum for me. Um, and now I am, I'm very cognizant of like, hey, depending where you bought this thing, you might be 18 cents in the money, you might be 13 cents in the money. For a 17 cent stock or something, that's really not too bad. And again, now I can kind of see the the argument for shorting. Um, if you have a pod, you can, it's it's interesting because then you'll, you'll hear other members start to argue the bear case and say they're thinking of, of, of a short. Um, I don't love shorting just on the second day up, right? If yes, if the prior day was a first, this is just a second, but I can understand it because it has traveled a fair amount. This is in general, a dilutive stock that does a lot of offerings. Just because you authorize a buyback does not mean you'll do it. You could in fact do exactly the opposite. Um, so I, I am wary of that and price action is king. So I'm a little concerned that we fail there. Um, then as we start to kind of approach those highs again, um, there is the possibility for that to become the lower high. And I think that's a very sensible place to start to sell um, or at least take some off with the hope that if not, we can always just consolidate and you can rebuy on any breakout above, say, 32 cents. 
Um, just because the other thing too is this range off the open now is like a seven cent range. Like that's pretty large as a percentage of this stock. I mean, if you have a lot of shares, um, you know, you, like those pennies matter. Um, so I, I see the argument for kind of taking off there. Um, and then what I really want to see is us start to hold above 30 cents. What happens is we don't hold and then we fail again below 30 cents and we kind of have, you know, this, this little mini support here and we end up breaking it. Not only that, but I'd imagine, even though I don't have VWAP drawn in, we're probably starting to get below VWAP. We're starting to get below the moving average. So if I then were to get flat or potentially initiate a short, I could see it being on that break there. The beauty of this is now you have a stop against highs. You've made a little bit of a lower high. So that, I think, is where the big turn is. I think that's a big inflection moment, right? We tried to go down you know, shake out some hands, but then boom, we drive through the resistance, but we fail there, right? So now we've tested both ends. Uh, we, we pull in deeply, we kind of make that lower high and we just, we just don't have it in us to consolidate and hold up. Well, when that breaks down, that is the moment of truth. And, um, that's where I think the short entry is. That's where I think the get flat is. The other possible is kind of that lower high there, knowing that this was such a big range. And so what does happen is we kind of then, over the course of the day, pull in. I mean, I think if you're not covering around the low 20s, like that's a little bit crazy to me. Um, I just can't imagine there's just so much meat on the bone at that point. For me to really love this short, I really would have wanted, I don't know, approaching 40 cents, maybe even 50 cents that day, just given like the cost of commissions and everything else. Um, trading fees are real, the spread is real. Um, you know, like, again, like, this is something where, like, a lot of guys did the short, even at, even at SMB, they did the long and the short, and um, I see it, but for me, nothing as asymmetric as that long, um, that initial long I discussed, or even that overnight, because the, the other thing to add as well is that's also the power of being with the trend, is sometimes the trend really, really surprises you. Not even sometimes, I would say more often than not, the trend can really have, um, have a lot more power than you would imagine. Um, especially in kind of this somewhat euphoric speculative market. Yeah, I definitely could have seen more out of this. Um, little disappointed it, it didn't go further, but nevertheless, like this was a really nice trader. So why do I think this was like such a such an in-play special stock? I mean, so for starters, the volume, for starters, the news catalyst, the catalyst, and for starters, how much it went up on that first day. Um, this is a type of stock that even though it's kind of like an under the radar name, that had all these criteria really pointing your attention to it. And I think that's also the beauty of a pod is you also get to see how other people are thinking. What was so funny is I had seen this stock and I was flying out to, to New York City. So I, I texted one of my pods about this thing. And, um, and you know, this is, this is how, you know, you're, you're with some good guys. Uh, they text me like, Oh, oh Lance, you know, jokes on you. We, we've, we've been on this ticker all day. And, uh, you know, they, they were jacked for the overnight. And like, that's the beauty of, of kind of having a team to, to alert things, to see, um, if, if, if people's mindsets agree to kind of argue these bare bull opinions. Right. Um, and I would say is when you have good traders in a pod and everybody tends to really be having that see up moment, that's when you can really, really push and size it. And after that day one close, there is nobody I knew that was arguing that, um, kind of that that bear thesis. Everyone was saying, boom, this is going to be potentially the the layup of the year. We're not going to see something else do volume like this. We're not going to see something else with such a beaten down chart like this, such a good news catalyst. Um, but then the cool thing is the next day around 30 cents, you know, I hear people starting to think like short and all of a sudden it's like, okay, like now I can see the other thing. I see their arguments. I understand it. Um, so the other like beauty of a pod is you're able to have this confluence of opinions and really dynamically um, navigate them and weigh them in real time, right? I'm always going to weigh my own opinion above anyone else's just due to my own experience and, and trusting myself, but it's still this weighted average of other traders I respect. Um, just because I'm long something, if, 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 if my buddy Lucas or if Nate is short, is that going to make me sell? No, absolutely not. But it is going to make me think about my position and, and kind of just weigh the pros and cons. So that's kind of the way I think about this stuff. Um, beyond that, you do kind of then need to be a little bit careful of, of things being range bound. Um, I mean, you kind of have the big, the, the two big up days, 
You then have the fader. At this point, like the stock is just so low priced. Like I, I, I mean, I just don't see the reason to trade it at this point. The ranges are so tight. Even if it goes down back into the teens, like who really cares? Um, so at this point, it's a no play. I think really the 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 best plays were of course day one and day two. Um, at that point, it just becomes two fifty fifty when it's just so low priced. Um, so yeah, happy to answer more questions about this. Hope this helped. Hope it was a good view into my thinking on these things and weighing, uh, the, the really big picture, the daily chart, the intraday. Um, so yeah, let me know any questions. Let's see if, if we can help it from there and, uh, appreciate you guys watching.